Hi guys and welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, for today's lecture we'll look at the Pueblos and the Mound Builders. And now our lectures are going to examine the sophisticated chiefdoms and states of North America that developed after the introduction of farming. And the two people that we'll look at are the Pueblos of the Southwest and the Eastern Mound Builders who inhabited the woodlands along the Mississippi Rivers and the Ohio River. And now the Puebloan centers were areas that thrived through interconnectedness, which played a major role in their lifespans. The mound builders, on the other hand, were the apogee of eastern state building efforts before the arrival of Columbus in 1492. And now the Pueblos arose when subsistence desert farmers around the year 300 BCE became much more productive. The agricultural patterns had developed uh, and a greater dependency on farmer among, uh, emerged amongst the people. The, agricult the, the cultural changes uh, that agriculture, that intensive agriculture brought were also vast and permanent. The settlements with the key attributes of the Pueblos began to appear around the years 600 and 800 CE, that is the common era, and they proliferated. And while no human group is ever truly self-sufficient, they all rely on each other for commodities, whether they're luxury goods or foodstuffs, and the Pueblos were no exception. They developed these towns, these centers that served as the condu conduces, con con conduits, I should say, for trade. And they maintained a highly organized and profitable trade contact with far-off groups exchanging goods such as turquoise, ceramics, foodstuffs, and copper. And now around the year 700 uh, CE, people were living in oval pits dug into the ground, dug into the ground and covered with mud and timber roots. And they began to transition to multi-room houses and above-ground storehouses. And this was a pretty good adaptation for people living in an area with very hot summers and very cold winters. And it didn't take long for this, for this uh, village settlement system to expand rapidly. And the settlements were in a land where the carrying and support capacity was low, but the storage capacity was high. And what I mean by carrying and support capacity, uh, the uh, the uh, the fertility of the soil of the areas that they were now living in was notably low. Uh, that the, the soils really couldn't produce uh, the type of foods, uh, the, the amount of food necessary to support all these people. So that's what I mean by the carrying and support capacity being low. And the two more prominent examples of these of the Puebloan culture of their sites are Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde. And these, uh, both of these sites are in New Mexico. And now Chaco Canyon served as the seat of the ancestral Pueblo culture that flowered between 900 and 1100 of the Common Era. And it was a major distribution center. And again, the soil was poor and not really able to support high populations of people. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation on what exactly was the main purpose of this site how the Puebloan people, uh, how they supported themselves there. And the site has, uh, could have been used as a simply, as simply a spot where they stored food for large gatherings when the smaller groups congregated there and the, and the smaller group would have congregated there for seasonal uh, ceremonies. Uh, but what is known about these sites is that they exhibited or they uh, had extensive control over the roads and water. And had I stated earlier, uh, we still don't really know whether these were permanent settlements uh, or whether they were simply elaborate market towns and ritual centers. Uh, and the consensus flips between uh, who you speak to. Some people believe that they were simply a an unusual concentration of settlements headed by powerful chiefs. Whatever they were, they were a, they were a remarkable flowering of culture until around the year 1130 when drought brought about Chaco Canyon's downfall. And its people, uh, reeling from the effects of drought, abandoned the site. And after the collapse, the Pueblo people moved north. And between 1230 and 1300, they were just seeking new centers. And at around, thir at around the year 1300, 
uh, their new site was abandoned and it was again brought down by drought and unpredictable rain. And after this, the Pueblo people sort of just splintered off into different groups. And you find the descendants of the Pueblos amongst the Anasazi, the Hohokam, and the Mogoyo peoples. Okay, and now to uh, sort of just switch uh, from the west, from the scene in the desert southwest over to the eastern woodlands, uh, I'd like to go and look at the Mississippian mound builders. And now the mound builders themselves were a very volatile culture in the southeast with elaborate burial customs. And again, these were river valley populations uh, in the east, in the eastern woodlands. Uh, you found that the people found life to be just more easy, uh, much more tolerable, much more easier to live in, to live in or close to river valleys where food supplies were just abundant. And the people, uh, they lived in these, uh, they lived in these uh, river valleys and populations rose so much that the mobility of these groups decreased and they began to cultivate the local plants and social states followed along with the large burials, the, long, the large burials. And as I stated earlier, uh, they're called the mound builders because they're marked out by their distinctive earthworks. And now the early Europeans who first encountered these mounds, they attributed them to a proto-European peoples that inhabited the Americas before the colonists arrived. And this opinion held sway largely until the end of the 19th century when it was decisively disproven using forensic analysis of the skeletal remains inside the burial mounds. And now the Adena site and the Adena culture. Uh, the, uh, the Adena were the first people to truly elaborate on burial mounds and they built these, these ceremonial enclosures of mounds for their kin leaders. And now around the year 400 uh, CE, the Hopewell and Adenas, uh, they collaborated in an effort to elaborate on a set of unifying beliefs that will come to be held by a large number of village societies who mainly lived off of hunting and gathering and became linked by the ceremonial exchange of gifts. And now the wooden mask, uh, obsidian, copper, and mica that was exchanged between them weren't really for everybody. This was more a way of cementing uh, bonds, bonds of friendship, or maybe even bonds of uh, kinship. But to but they were more they were more in line of keeping trade routes open, allowing uh, one village to send its uh, its raw goods or its finished product to one good to one village in exchange for the other. It was more of a way of keeping the peace between uh, keeping the peace and keeping relationships friendly between different uh, settlements. And now the small villages uh, that cooperated in this exchange hint at a great and a far-reaching ideological accord that extended remarkably from New York, uh, modern-day New York State, all the way down to the, to the uh, state of Louisiana. And in around the year 1000, a shift occurs. And this shift is in religious and political power. And it's a shift southwards. And this occurs right around the time that maize and beans become critical crops. Population growth and the demands of social uh, elites sort of necessitated the adoption of these two crops to meet the to meet the uh, demand the demands of these urban centers, and they replaced the older, more traditional food sources. Uh, so you so you clearly see a. Uh, a breaking at this point with the traditional hunting and gathering culture and the adoption of more sedentary agriculture. Uh, the uh, the mainstream and and uh, main effort, I should say, uh, agriculture now becomes the, the undisputed main effort of all these settlements. <clears throat> and now the uh, major social and political changes that followed. Uh, the, the cultures that appeared in the uh, Mississippi River Valleys uh, interacted constantly with each other and these centers were located again in the fertile river bottoms and often by lakes and swamps and they were dispersed homesteads uh, compact villages and even what we might consider small towns and now the best example of these uh, probably the prime example of these is a site called Cahokia and Cahokia is on the Mississippi River and it was home to literally thousands of farmers and Cahokia itself flourished and its burial mounds dominated the landscape for miles to come. And the town, uh, Cahokia, 
it was laid out it was uh, situated at the very strategic convoluence and the and a convoluence is simply where rivers come together it was uh, situated at the strategic convoluence of the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers where trade routes abounded uh, and the rulers, the rulers of Cahokia, were very adept at manipulating the trade routes to accumulate wealth and power for themselves. And now the Mississippian uh, states, the, the mound builder states, uh, the settlements, they were small by comparison to the other pre-contact American states. That would be the state of the Olmecs or the Incas in Peru, the Aztecs in Mexico, the Mayas in uh, the Yucatan. Uh, they were they were very small compared to them. They didn't. Uh, they they also weren't very unified. The the mound builders remained independent, small settlements, uh, simply linked by this uh, by this exchange, by the cultural exchange and the shared cultural phenomena of building uh, burial mounds. It was never a a unified state, and that's something that uh, and that that's something that um that it shares with the early states of Mesopotamia where you had these urban centers with uh, outlying farming, uh, rural farming areas supporting them exchanging goods with other urban centers that are, that are again supported by outlying rural farming areas. Okay, and and as I stated, they were volatile. They were rooted in ancestor worship and the agricultural cycle. And they depended on the charisma of their leaders. And now the entire mound builder culture collapsed around the year 1250 under the strain caused by other chiefdoms in the south, more unified states. Uh, the mounds, uh, ne while never holding a geographic, uh, while, while never representing a geographic hold by one uh, sovereign state or one or one universal entity on the uh, southeast while it remained a patchwork of petty state both large and small it nonetheless represented a great leap and a great bound in the organization of states cultures and peoples in the southeast it was a it was a building step that uh, other people that future peoples would have emulated and looked up to and reordering and reorganizing geographic areas uh, and now that we've looked at the major groups in the Americas and we've tracked their progressions from the arrival of the first Paleo-Americans all the way down to the establishment of the first uh, real states, the first real large-scale political entities or, or uh, large-scale associations of different, uh, different geographic regions in the United States, I'd like to sort of switch things up and go and examine the events in the Mediterranean that were to have a very, uh, a very serious impact, a, a very prominent impact on the future of the Americas. And as always, I am Ted. Uh, I hope you guys liked the lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, hit like, subscribe, tell your friends, leave a comment. And as always, I'll see you next time.